Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Grateful that God's given us the privilege to gather together uh, in his house here at Good Shepherd. Thankful that in the midst of our lives, no matter what's transpired this past week or what is in front of you next week, that the very God of the universe that has created you and created everything that we see, that God has promised to be with you in those circumstances. So we're thankful for that. And it's, as a pastor, I'm smart enough to know that, and wise enough to know that life is not an easy trek and not everything joyful will happen next week, but not everything sorrowful will happen next week. But into the midst of this moment, God has promised to be present. Worship is about our connecting with that God in a conversation of worship. So we're thankful for that this morning. This will give you a hint as far as where we're going to be in worship today. And I want to let you know I was in the parking lot on over near the 24-hour fitness and the Hampton Inn on the west side where there's a food lion or food, food, yeah, food. Food Land. Food Lion is in North Carolina. Uh, food Land is here. There's a sign on, on the, on a, uh, uh, on the, in the parking lot that said, lock your car, take your keys, hide your belongings. To report suspicious activities, contact security at this number, 808-628-4810. in a very nice neighborhood at, uh, on the, on the, away, far away from Messiah, because they're in a more difficult, challenged neighborhood. They're in a wonderful neighborhood at a wonderful brand new uh, shopping center. That's the sign. What does that say about us as a people? Today, I have the chance to be able to bring to you the, the first of seven sermons and a service that's going to be focused around uh, the Ten Commandments. And in the next seven weeks, each week is going to be a proclamation of the hope of Jesus in the midst of the, uh, of, of the heart of the catechism. I can, because I'm an old man, and I'm wise, I can preach Jesus right through the very teeth of the catechism. Because that's how Martin Luther wrote it. He wrote it so that we would see Christ in the middle of our catechism. It's not just a boring man-made document. We're going to speak about Jesus and the hope of the catechism and the heart of Jesus we're going to be able to discover and to find. The reason is, is that I wanted to put together a sermon series on the catechism for a number of years now, and I'm going to do it because the folks over at Messiah, the, the majority of them have not been through a, an adult uh, confirmation class. And so during sermons, you're going to hear a, re a review of that wonderful thing called the catechism. But it's not going to be boring. It's not going to be, oh, we have to do this. This is not going to be a class. It is going to be worship. And each one of those parts of the catechism will give to you a, a picture of Jesus. You will notice in your newsletter when you receive it, if, if you rec anybody received it online or have seen it in hard copy? There is a, a, a woman that used to worship here named uh, Eva Eva Hubbard, and she has, I, I asked her uh, if she would just give me an, a beginning point of learning maybe a Hawaiian word that would be associated with one of the six, each one of the six chief parts. It's not a final statement. It's not all that you need to, it's maybe not even really close on the dartboard in terms of getting it completely understood, but I'm grateful that she put this together for us. And so whenever you see this uh, newsletter, and you'll see a, a, a Hawaiian word that will describe each one of the, of the six chief parts. And it's good for us to be able to, to think about that. So we begin worship today with, uh, with the singing of our first two songs. Uh, and we'll stand as we do that. Um, be the center and I surrender all. Please rise.
sometimes we find it difficult to follow through with what that song invites us to do. We fight uh, the desire to give everything that we have to God. I think in honesty, we probably say we can't do that. You want to give God everything? That's a really difficult thing to do. To surrender everything that you have and you are to God? Good luck with that. But we come to worship, to start worship with saying, okay, Lord, in confession and absolution, we're going to surrender to you our worst, our broken places, our error, our sin, our failure. That's where we begin with what we surrender. And we do so in confession and absolution because the promise is that God can forgive us. So we'll do that as we begin worship today. We make our beginning in the God who is mighty to save, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, action, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May our Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. And as your pastor this day, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I announce unto you the full forgiveness of all of your sins. All those things that you just admitted that you surrendered to God, I do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Like to have you be seated at this time. The words of the intro deepen after we've spoken to God that we need God through confession and absolution. Our worship immediately deepens and we find partners in the Old Testament, basically King David who either wrote the Psalms or collected all of them. We now funnel farther down into worship through the words of the Psalms. Psalm 119, I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Seven times a day I praise you for your just and righteous decrees. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. And only a heart that knows the love of God can speak those words. You can't do it on your own. You cannot, you cannot speak these words of Psalm 119 unless you know the God that loves you and has forgiven you and has claimed you as his own. Then you can speak these words as David. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. We join our hearts together in prayer. O oh God, our refuge and strength, the author of all godliness, by your grace hear the prayers of your church. Grant that those things which we ask in faith we may receive through your bountiful mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our God, our help in ages past. Yeah. 
Good morning. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 20, starting at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 1. I was, yeah, starting with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. May I ask uh, Mason and Logan's grandmother, is she here today? Oh, could you go get those two boys and bring them up here for me, please? But what, we want the grandmother to do this. We need Mason and Logan to come up to do a little children's message with their grandmother. Is that a good idea? Yeah. I think that will be very important. Then they can go back into their room and we can shut them up. <laughs> Hi, Mom. We love you. You're going to be coming up here in a minute in just a second, but we want to have Mason and Logan come on up here for just a second with your grandma. But you come up here, dude. No, no are you, I, hold, stand up here, right here. You, are you Mason or Logan? Mason. You're Mason. We need Logan up here too. Is that going to be a t mom? Do you want to bring Logan up here? Maybe, maybe grandma won't be able to do this. <laughs> Thank you. Because it's very important that we, we listen to this here. Um, do you mind if I pick you up? Is that okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. It, it said in, in that lesson, you see right there, I want you to come up here in just a second. It just said in that lesson out of Timothy that grandmothers and mothers are very important for little boys and little girls. Did you hear that? Uh, grandmothers and mothers do something really, really important. I'm not going to marginalize dads and grandpas because I'm one. And I do, I love my grandsons and my granddaughter. They're 22, 18, and two 15 year old grandsons. All right, so I get it. I love my grandsons. Taught them how to drive, okay. taught them how to f swim. I, I love my grandsons and my granddaughters. I do that. But in the scriptures, it says it was important for Timothy to have a grandmother and a mother that knew the love of God in Christ. Because that mother and that grandmother said to these little boys, and Timothy was one of them, that Jesus is the most important thing going out there. And you want to come up here for just a second. I want you to walk up here and just, th this place right here is the baptismal font. I think these two boys are baptized, right? These boys were claimed by God here because of family, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and you as a family of the church. Right here is where uh, Mason and Logan were connected to the death and resurrection of Jesus. That means everything to these boys. That world out there is going to want to consume these boys. It's going to make them be distant from their faith and from their family and from themselves. That's the way the world works. We know that. But because of what you've done, you've, you said the first thing of the, of before the Old Testament is the, is the Ten Commandments. starts with verse 3. Verse 2 says God saved us, brought us out of slavery, set us free. And so remember that that these boys here have been set free because of the love of God in Christ. And I love these boys. Uh, I was one that about this age, and I was about this way right here. This guy here, I, I, I love this guy because he reminds me of... <laughs> I got it. How, how you do with that? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Does the blood pressure go up a little bit? Yeah, I got it. We, we got you. But we want you to know that the family of faith is so very important for these, for these boys because it says in the Scriptures today, the epistle lesson, Grandmas and, and moms do something really wonderful. And, and the church is a part of that. And then it says in the Old Testament lesson that the first thing before the Ten Commandments were even spoken that Bubba read is that God rescued us out of the land of slavery. And baptismal font, baptismal font is where this happens. And so we're going to be reminded of that. So thanks for hauling them up here. I'm sweating, are you? I'm going to hot right <laughs> These boys can make you hot, don't yeah. they? Let's have a prayer, shall we? Lord, we're grateful for our, these, these two young boys and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and the family of faith that walk alongside of them. I pray that you would always remind us that you've rescued us and that from that place you claim us as your own. And uh, be with these young families that do this big work in a world that doesn't want them to, these kids to know Jesus, but we pray that, that, that they would continue to do that hard work with the assistance of a church. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks for coming up, appreciate that. Yeah, you, we got you, dude. You know, you're like a little heater here, buddy. I'm, I'm, I'm sweating like a horse.
there we go. I don't know. I, I, older I get, the more teary-eyed I get. You know, maybe that's just what happens in life, but it's all right. I was more this whenever I was a young, young man, and I'm getting more, uh, those old boys, so there's uh, something special about that, right? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not crazy, correct? <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, it's like, uh, and we have a big work to do with our moms and dads and little kids. And we need to continue to do that work. Let's rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. And you're going to find uh, in the gospel lesson today a reminder of Jesus. When he starts to talk down in Luke 17, he's going to say, don't mess up with these kids. And he said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and were to cast into the sea, then he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you are invited to forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. This is a hard thing to do. And the Lord said, if you had a faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted into the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. The Apostles' Creed, wonderful summary of our Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. The Ten Commandments, and we're going to have a couple of phrases, uh, frames coming up, not necessarily right now, but I want to review for you. Most of us start the Ten Commandments with verse 3. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 says, You will have no other gods. Right? That's how it starts. But I have always asked myself, and I continue to ask myself, where did Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2 go? Have you ever asked that question? When you talk about the Ten Commandments and the Catechism? We always start the Ten Commandments with verse 3 of chapter 20 of Exodus. Now the question is, where in the world did verse 1 and 2 go? Now, I want to talk with you about that as we start a, a, a reminder of what these beautiful things called the Ten Commandments, what they're all about. So we're good. And by the way, you need to know that when you're done with church today, as you're leaving, you can have a complete summary of this particular uh, sermon today. And every Sunday, there's going to be a summary of the, of these, at the back of the church. So pick one up on your way out. And everything that I'm going to cover right now, in the proclamation of Jesus in the middle of the catechism, you'll be able to take home with you and, a, and an outline of my sermon. So you don't have to worry about scurrying around trying to remember everything, because that's not the point of proclamation. Pastors don't, we're not teachers on Sunday morning. We are proclaimers. Proclaimers that those two little boys that were just up here have a God that loves them. So do you. So my job isn't to be boring up here and make you take notes. My job is to proclaim Christ Jesus himself so that you can take it with you as you leave. But where in the world did verses 1 and 2 of, Genesis, of Exodus chapter 20 go? I worked for the National Park Service for five summers doing forest firework and backcountry patrol and looking for lost people. 
That's what I did to get myself through college as well as part of the seminary. And I made mention of this in the newsletter that was sent your way either electronically or hard copy. And if you're not on that electronic uh, uh, listing, let, let Sandy know and she'll make it up to you and so we can make sure the, the newsletter goes out to everybody. One, and I'm, I'm going to make mention of this, even if it's a repetitive thing that you've already read. A Down syndrome boy, 16 years old, was lost in the backcountry of Lassen Volcanic National Park, my territory that I was responsible for, my ranger station. Mom and dad came running into me and said, my son is gone, our son is gone. They had taken a nap, they weren't at fault, they were taking a nap in their tent in a, in a backcountry campground where there was probably 100 campsites and their boy woke up early and he walked out of the tent. And he ended up walking into the woods hundreds of um, hundreds and hundreds of square miles of a forest he disappeared and they didn't know where he was they came to me i immediately did a precursory search called the rest of the people that were to assist me especially my supervisor because that's what i was required to do and a huge search grid was put out looking for this 16 year old down syndrome boy he was not found on day number one darkness came and during the, that day, sheriff's department came, the minimum security prison inmates came, there was park service crew, and a grid was developed to look for this boy because they knew that it got down to 28 degrees at night and he didn't have but a light jacket on. No food, no water, no shelter. I will always remember that particular day when he was found was ponderosa pine or this huge, trees this big around, and there were two of them laying side by side in the middle of a massive forest. And one of the minimum security prison guys stepped up on a log, looked to, to make sure his footing was secure, to step over to the other room and look down, and he stepped right on the boy. And the Park Service uh, radio system came alive. We have found the boy alive. And I tell you, there was rejoicing in heaven over one lost sinner having been found. You know how that, it was just, it, it, man, the chatter on that radio was just marvelous. But, it, but that boy was found, life flighted to a, a, a local um, hospital, was treated for exposure, dehydration, some cuts and bruises, and he, he was, he was uh, well within a week. But I found it wonderful that a minimum security prisoner found him. Someone who was incarcerated stepped on this young boy and pulled him out from his certain death if he would not have stepped on that exact place in that massive forest looking for that boy. Jesus was a prisoner whenever he died for us and gave his life for us on Calvary's cross. He was the one that, he was stepped on for our well-being. And Jesus, it says, his heel was bruised as he crushed the head of Satan. There, Jesus rescues us and pulls us from our certain death to safety. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2 says this. God rescued Hundreds of thousands of people from 430 years of slavery and pulled them into a new place of living. And that's the kind of God that then says, why do you want any other gods? Do you remember this? It says, before the Ten Commandments were even spoken, Moses, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, says, Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people were pulled from 430 years of slavery and set free by the mercy of God. And then Exodus chapter 20 says, remember that. That's how it begins. And then things like, you don't want to have any other gods. You don't want to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You're going to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You're going to honor your father and mother. Don't murder, steal, kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't, don't lie about your neighbor. Don't covet, don't covet, don't covet, don't covet, don't covet. I just said the Ten Commandments for you, just like that. Every one of them. I didn't miss one. Can you do that? What's wrong with that system? 
Take care of your neighbor's goods. That's a pretty good idea, don't you think? Don't steal your neighbor's stuff. Help them take care of it. Uh, that, that's Martin Luther's take on thou, thou shalt not steal. It isn't just don't you do this. It is, uh, okay, your neighbor has things. And what your job is is not to go over and take their stuff. Your job is to go over and I'm your neighbor, and I want to make sure you know that I'm your neighbor, and I'm going to help you take care of your stuff. Doesn't that sound a whole lot better to live civilly that way than, oh, good, I'm going to go steal your stuff? Doesn't that sound better to do it that way than to say, lock your car, take your keys, hide your belongings, because somebody's going to steal something from you? We live in a world where people love to steal one another's stuff. My, my, what is this all about? That's a, I, don't, I don't want to live that way, do you? I would rather live with the, the, com, the commands of God that are just invitations to, do, to live civilly, guiding my life. I, why do I want to want somebody else's stuff for my stuff? Guess what happens when the last two commandments, 9 and 10, happen? You, you want somebody else's Camaro because you're driving a Volkswagen? And you want it so bad that you forget to change the oil in your Volkswagen. Guess what happens in about two years? You don't have either one. Coveting steals from you the ability to take care of your stuff, whether it's a lot of stuff or a little stuff. And the commandments invite us to help us take care of our neighbor's stuff. That's why Christian, Christianity is not ludicrous. It's not, we're not crazy people for wanting to help live civilly in a, in a society. What, why, do, why does our culture mock Christianity for being some frivolous way to live life? Not me. I'm glad I can be instructed to live in a good way. Think about it. When we don't instruct our kids and one another to live well, culture falls apart. So I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm all right with the Ten Commandments instructing me. When you look at the Ten Commandments, they're laid out in two basic uh, categories. The first three deal with you and God. It's, if you have a cross, it's right here. The first table of the law go this way, up and down, vertically. And then the second table of the law go horizontally, your relationship with people. That's how the Ten Commandments, right? that's two tablets of the law. That's why they're laid out that way. So right here is the, is the stuff that you need to think about in your relationship with a God who can save you. Right here, has saved you. Why do you need any other God that can rescue you out of such dismal circumstances? And then why not take some time out to worship that God? And, 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 and let's not use his name like a garbage can. Every single confirmation class I've ever done with junior high kids, I've always asked one question about, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I've always asked them, how many of you have used God's name in vain? Meaning things like saying, God damn it, or Jesus Christ. And do you understand that literally, I had a confirmation class of 35 kids, and every single one of them in the, last, in the last week of their life had heard that at least five to ten times from their homes, from the, from the television, from the music, using God's name who can rescue us and pull us into a great new place to live. They've heard God's name used as a trash. Why? A God that loves you? A God that's going to give his only begotten son for you? One who's going to want you to live civilly with your neighbors? Why, why would you do that? But I was raised in a home where that occurred. How about you? My mom was good at that. My dad was a quiet guy. Look out for my mother. That girl. But, uh, but the idea of using a, a God's name who rescued us in a good way I'm all, I mean, I'm all in on that at this point in time in my life. And then I'm going to want you to know that the, the, the horizontal plane, I'm not going to lie about you. I'm going to do my very best not to do that. I'm not going to gossip about you. I'm going to do my very best not to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to try to help you take care of your stuff. I'm going to try to live honorably because God says this is a way in which people that know that they've been rescued are going to do their deal. 
People that know that they've been rescued from that death point, right between two logs stuck. That, that, that God has rescued you and I, forgiven us of our sins, given us life now and life eternally, given us a new way to live in this life. I'm going I'm to try to say those commandments can help me learn. What, the commandments are interesting in that they kind of put a mirror on our lives, right? All you have to do is read the commandments, and one thing you're going to know, you don't measure up to them. Martin Luther says that the commandments are a mirror to us. So take a look at the commandments and what you, what's going to happen to you, and it happens to me every morning when I look at the catechism or look at the Ten Commandments, I look at the commandments and I say, I don't measure up, I fail. And if Jesus says, if you've messed up on one of them, you've messed up on all of them. So therefore, you're put into a position of stuck between two logs. And there you need to know that the Savior of the world has stepped right where you are, and he's lifted you and says, like Logan and Mason, I love you, and you're forgiven, and you're mine. The Ten Commandments, aren't, it, it, they are a part of the catechism. But they're a part of the catechism because they help us see our need for a Savior. And they help us then learn how to live civilly in a society and culture. And they help us know God. There's a song, maybe it, it was in 1979. Maybe you know the, 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 the kind of the quasi-pop group called uh, The Police. And the lead singer was called Sting. And they sang a song called Message in a Bottle. Remember that? Remember that song? When you're lost in the backcountry, and I'm going to get back to that song in just a second. When you're lost in the backcountry, this little young man did not have this in his backpack, but if you're lost in the backcountry, one of the essential things that you need is a mirror. Correct? Small little mirror. It isn't so that you can look at yourself, because you're going to see somebody lost if you're lost. But it's to signal somebody else that you might see far away in a vehicle or on the other ridge way, way, you can take the sun and send an SOS. Flash, 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 however you do that. Morse code. Off it goes, and you send a signal that says, I need help. I don't know about you, but the reason I've come to church today is that I know I fail under all the commandments, all of them. I... I even have a hard time surrendering that truth. But I've come to church today to say, I'm in trouble. The mirror is not to say, oh, look at me. The mirror is to say, God, I need help. And that song by the police, with Sting as the, the lead singer, 22 times in that song it says, I'm sending out an SOS in a message in a bottle. 22 times. I'm sending out an SOS. I'm sending out an SOS. I'm not going to do it 22 times, but you get the idea. When we come to church, we're sending out an SOS to God that says, Lord, I need your help because I can't get it done on my own. And then we hear Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. God rescued his people out of the land of bondage and slavery. You're one of those people God has rescued. They're in the font. And we have the wonderful news that we have been forgiven and God has pulled us to a place of safety. I love these Ten Commandments. They are part of the way in which I live and move and have my being. The commandments show us the nature of God. They show us how to live and they show us the need for a Savior. When you leave today, take this handout. It'll be a general summary of what we've just covered. But I, I know that we can see Jesus through this. For on this cross, where we might have failed all of the vertical and all the horizontal, the two tablets of the law, Jesus hung, giving his life for our brokenness. And then when he was taken off that cross dead, he was laid in a tomb, because he died because of our failure in front of the Ten Commandments. And then three days later, he stepped free. And he said one thing, I'm God, and I love you, and you can't be taken from me. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in faith through Christ Jesus, our resurrected and living Lord and Savior. Let us uh, rise for a time of prayer and then the preparation of the Lord's table.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful that you've given to us the privilege of joining us here in worship today. You've invited us to remember the Sabbath day to, and keep it holy because you set us apart here to hear who you are. Lord, we're grateful that when we look at the commandments and we fall short, which every single person does, if we're honest, that it's at that place of recognition that we're busted, that you come and repair us. When we're lost, you come and find us. And Lord, we pray that we would always remember that the commandments were set into a part of the scriptures that follow your great rescue. Lord, help those commandments to guide us and to norm our lives. And when we look at them and we see failure, help us to also know that the rest of your word tells us about how you've forgiven us and set us free. Lord, we're grateful that we've come together as your people this morning. Be with all those in our congregation who are suffering from illness, accidents, surgery. Be with them in their recovery. Lord, be with doctors and nurses as they care for those who are sick. Be with all those at Good Shepherd who are isolated and shut in. Guide them in their lives. Help them to know in a quiet way through the visitation of a friend or a family member that knows your love. To, to, to know that they find uh, your presence in the middle of their uh, isolation. Lord, be with this congregation a Good Shepherd. Help the folks that are distant from Good Shepherd find their way back. And Lord, we pray that you would surprise us with the new people that are going to be a part of this uh, congregation in the future. Help us to be ready for those people. We're so very grateful for the, for the Loises and the Eunices that are present, the moms and the dads and the congregation that make it possible for little kids to know your great love. Lord, we can speak these words from our lips as well as those that we are, offer silently in our hearts knowing you hear them because of Jesus. Lord, these prayers we offer in the name of Jesus who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As I prepare the Lord's table for reception of Holy Communion, this morning when we come for communion, I'm going to ask that you would come continuously. And as you come, we'll, uh, both uh, Warren and I will be present at the bottom of the steps and have you come forward and receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And we will make our way forward. It's such a good practice of worship to come. You're invited to come to the, to the presence of, of Jesus because your sins are forgiven. And you will receive body and blood, and then when you are all returned back to your seats, you'll be seated, and then I will have the final blessing for you at that time. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of Jesus' body and his blood on the cross. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the very night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had broken that bread and given thanks, he gave that bread to his disciples, to his followers, and he said these words, Take and eat. This is my body, which has been given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. In the same manner also Jesus took the cup. When he had supped and given thanks, he gave that cup to his disciples, to his followers, and he said these words, They can drink this cup is the New Testament shed for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated.
Warren and I will commune you first. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all your sins. The blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Come to the Lord's table. Yeah. Oh, that would be fine. Whatever the best way is. That was good. Come to the Lord's table. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. This is the body of Christ, given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ, given for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Take and eat the very body of Christ, given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the body of Christ, given for you for the full forgiveness of all of your sins. Be reminded daily of the love that Jesus has for you in the waters of your baptism. Amen. Is there anybody else that is need, needs communion at this time? Oh, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. And now may this very body and blood of our risen and resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ both strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith and the life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Please rise. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you of your mercy that you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The love of Christ compels us to go in his name. benediction found in the sixth chapter of the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift upon you his countenance, his presence, 
and give you this day his eternal peace. Amen. Please be seated. This time, um, I have been reminded that there has been a couple birthdays at church. So I, I, I know that uh, I think Randy's birthday was, when was your birthday, Randy? Today? Oh, and and Marlis' birthday was, when was that? <laughs> Last week. There's going to be a birthday song right now. you as uh, the week unfolds. The catechism is not a, a, a sterile document. It is so very alive and full of hope. And may you find Jesus as we move through it in this little window of time. And if you have friends that you would like to be able to encounter the catechism and see it, invite them to come with you. We're going to be getting ready to celebrate our membership at Good Shepherd and at Messiah on the 20th of November. We're going to recommit ourselves to our congregations. We have done that as adults through adult confirmation and membership. You know, that's how that happens. But there needs to be times when we recommit. And if there happens to be somebody that moves through this sequence and they've completed this the sequence, then we're going to welcome new members on that Sunday as well. So both will happen on that day here and at Messiah. I love the catechism because it always pushes me to Christ. And may we enjoy this journey together and uh, make sure you pick up this uh, sermon outline and this part of the catechism on your way out today. God bless you. Pray for the people on the freeway and, and I don't need that sign over at the shopping center myself. I'll make sure that somebody's doors are locked to help them with the parking lot. God bless you. God bless you. Love endures forever For he is good, he is above all things His love endures forever Sing praise That's hilarious Sing praise With a mighty hand and outstretched arm His love endures forever few announcements this morning. Are we on? Okay. Just a few announcements this morning.
Wow, we're in for a wild ride for the next six weeks. The sermon series will continue, and next week we'll talk about the Apostles' Creed, our statement of faith. We will have a church work day on the 15th from about 8 to noon. Uh, and uh, so we'll put out more about what you need to bring, either some kind of tools or what the tasks will be. Uh, join us for our fellowship on Lanai. We've got lots of goodies and lots of hot coffee. Have a great week.